historical sketch on the destruction of Dresden 72 years ago, we briefly examined, examined the historical and political background leading to this event, as well as the tools, if the word applies, the tools with which the genocide, and I cannot think of any other word, the genocide was carried out. In the second and including episode, we will follow the actual attack, which, as we saw, was carried out in three stages. The first two at a distance of, of three hours from each other to maximize the number of people killed. And why three hours and no more or less? Three hours was a good time for the incendiary bombing to do its worst, and, and simultaneously for the firemen from neighboring departments to come and help with the fire. The firemen would then meet the second wave of bombing and be killed themselves while they were trying to deal with the destruction caused by the first wave. On February 13, 1945, at three minutes before eight, eight mosquito planes took off from England. In one of them was the martyr leader, the leader of the mosquito squadron, whose task it was to release the flares of the Dresden targets to be destroyed. The mosquitoes would reach Dresden via a different route than the other squadrons, which was which was which were made up of Lancaster and Halifax planes, about 1,000 planes in all. At 9:49 p.m., one of the one of the mosquitoes picked up the low run signal that enabled top pilots to locate where they were in Germany. This is from the previous episode. They were 50 miles away from Dresden. And now they knew how to direct themselves towards the target. In the meantime, one of the Lancasters had reached Dresden via another route and had dropped a green flare over the bend in the river Elbe detected by Reda, the noticeable landmark. Both Lancasters and mosquitoes dropped flares, but the mosquitoes flew at a lower altitude and would be more accurate in their target individuation. The main reference target for the Dresden attack was the stadium, and that's where the first mosquito flare were directed. Soon the Allied squadrons were to discover that Dresden was undefended. And this, as mentioned in the previous episode, was due a combination of fatal, fatal coincidences. The German defense system was quite well organized, but this was the very end of the war. All the facilities producing synthetic fuel were con constantly bombed and there was a fuel shortage. And that directive had arrived from Berlin, Berlin Debrich, to, to restrict the operation of the night fighters. The center had detected the first 20, 244 bombers in the German skies, but were wondering where the other 750 would be would be flying towards war to where a squadron of German night fighters were on the tarmac at an airfield about six miles in, in, north of Dresden, but the field commander could not get in touch with Berlin Derberich. Eventually, at 9:55 p.m., the order came from the German operations center to send up the to scramble the night fighters, but it was too late and only a total of 27 night fighters were available against a flying squadron army of 1,000 bombers. The mosquitoes were already on the city dropping flares. It was an old city, we could perhaps call it the Florence of Saxony, a center of beautiful architecture and culture. The marker leader of the mosquitoes was surprised to see no searchlight, no flak fired, and he realized that the city was undefended. To add, to add to the confusion of the German defenses, the German defenses took the mosquitoes as they arrived from the direction of Chemnitz. They took them for the Lancaster bombers that came from the direction of another place called Riesa. The Lancasters arrived at the very minute as planned, 10.15 p.m., and along the way they released a continuous stream of what was called window, that is, thin pieces of aluminum or metallized glass fiber designed to confuse to confuse the raiders of the enemy with the multiple returns, effectively shielding the attacking planes from detection. And now became begun rather the, the apocalypse. The Dresden Dresden citizens had by now descended into the cellars and protected bunkers below their houses, some of which were 
up to 1,000 years old. In Germany, during an impending air attack, the broadcast was interrupted and substituted by a ticking clock. At 10.09, the ticking clock was interrupted by a voice saying, Achtung, Achtung, the first wave of the large enemy bomber formation had changed course and are now close to the city boundaries. Go at once to your basement and tell her. Those, were, had, those who had not done so already complied. The master bomber, the master bomber in, the, in his own mosquito, uh, instructed the first of the 100 plus Lancasters to lower their altitude to below a thin cloud layer to aim the bombs more accurately. The huge 4,000 pounds and 8,000 pounds incendiary bombs started to fall and explode. They were designed to smash windows and rip off roofs of houses. By 10.18 p.m., the bombs were covering the whole of the area so well marked by the flares. And the marker bomber was advising the last group of incoming Lancasters to be sure to pick out the red glow of the flare. The marker bomber had only three minutes left before returning back to England. He could send, he could send a more signal to England saying, target attack successfully, primary plan completed. And now empty bombers of the first wave turned back, flying below 6,000 feet to elude the German radar system. They climbed back to 15,000 feet after Strasbourg, and in the meantime, the second bombing wave was arriving from England, crossing the front line at 20 miles north of Luxembourg. First, in this new bomber stream flew the blind eliminator Lancasters, loaded with time bombs and parachute flares and magnesium lanterns set to ignite at 20,000 feet to light up the countryside so that the deputy, the deputy master bomber, could see where the bombs were exploding. You remember that the first master left when the first attack was completed. During the pre action, the action briefing of the second attack, some airmen were told that they would be destroying the Gestapo headquarters in Dresden. Others were told that they would destroy a vital ammunition plant, and yet others were told that they would destroy a large poison gas plant. Needless to say, this was fake news. They were also told that the raid on Dresden was intended to help the Red Army, and some airmen asked logically why the Red Army itself did not conduct the raid because they were only 80 miles away instead of more than 1,000 miles from the target. Furthermore, most of them know that Dresden, beside the local population, had several hundred thousand refugees and about 27,000 prisoners of war. This question will remain forever unanswered why it happened. Officially, as I said in the first episode, the general idea kept secret was to kill as many civilians as possible to sap the morale of those who survived. The purpose of the second raid, anyway, was to spread the fires as much as possible and to prevent any firemen to attempt to extinguish, to extinguish the fire started during the first wave of bombing. Many of the Lancasters in the second wave carried 4,000 pounds high explosive bombs and as many as 70, 750 pounds clusters of incendiaries which they could sell in the plane. Each cluster consisted of a trunk filled with 21-inch, 4-pound uh, thermite incendiary. Altogether, 650,000 incendiary bombs were released through the first and the second wave of Dresden. The second wave of bombers did not need Loran equipment to find out where they were, because the fires of Dresden from the first attack were visible more than 50 miles away. The time set for the next bombing was 1.30 a.m., on February Ash Wednesday. At 1.23 a.m., the blind illuminator Lancasters released their green flares over the bend of the River Elbe. That was hardly necessary now because the master bomber found the whole, that the whole center of Dresden was engulfed into a violent firestorm. A strong wind was blowing and the smoke was obscuring the target. And a quick decision, quick decision had to be taken 
and the Lancasters were instructed to aim the bombs at areas that were not as yet burning, but close to the city center that was all on fire. The world is in some areas of Dresden, the alarm sirens did sound, but in most districts the power supplies failed during the first attack and the second wave took people by surprise. As the Lancasters of the second wave approached the city, the bomb aimers could see a long line of trucks arriving to Dresden with relief supplies and fire brigades coming from other cities, which means the strategy of the raid had worked. Just as the firemen reach the city, they will be annihilated by the second wave of bombing. An airman wrote in his diary that the fires below were so bright, so bright <coughs> that the, the airplanes could see each other as well as their vessel trails. And quoting from another diary, the fantastic glow from 200 miles away grew ever brighter as we moved into the target. At 20,000 feet, we could see details in the unearthly blaze that had never been visible before. And here is another quote from another airman. It was my practice never to leave my seat, but my skipper called me on this particular occasion to come and have a look. The sight was indeed fantastic. From some 20,000 feet, Dresden was a city with every street etched in fire. Throughout the inferno, the German night fighters positioned five miles from the city were at the airport waiting to, for the authorization to scramble. But the station commander, instructed by the station commander, but now, though he had ordered the crews to the cockpit, he also had been instructed in this second atta attack to give precedence to a squadron of airplanes, German airplanes, expected to be arriving from the east, forced away by the advance of the Red Army. And now, the station commander could not contact the Berlin Goberitz Center to allow the scramble to scramble the squadron. The German radio communications had been jammed during every major night attack by the Allied radio countermeasures. A German pilot wrote in his diary, A major attack on Dresden. The city was smashed to pieces. We had to stand by and look on how could such a thing have been possible. People are hinting more and more of sabotage, or at least of an irresponsible defeatism in the gentleman, defeatism in the gentleman, in the common staff. And the feeling that these things are mar marching to the end with giant strides. What then, wretched fatherland? The ground defenses were completely silent. For ten minutes, a Lancaster equipped with cameras circled the target building filming the whole scene, now stored, all this film is stored in the archive of the Imperial War Museum in England. One of the airmen in the last Lancaster who arrived at the scene wrote, There was a sea of fire covering, in my estimation, 40, 40 square miles. The heat striking out from the furnace below could be felt in my cockpit. The sky was vivid in hues of scarlet and white, and the light inside the aircraft was that of a nearly autumn sunset. We were so aghast on the phosphor blaze that although alone over the city, we moved around in the standoff position for several minutes before turning for home, quite subdued by the city on fire from end to end. The summary of the attack is conveyed by this communique. Last night, Bomber Command dispatched 1,400 aircraft the main objective was Dresden, message ends. But that was not the end. A new force of American bombers was already lifting into the air from England. It would arrive in daylight. The principal target was for the now 1,350 U.S. flying fortresses when liberated was Dresden once again. However, this last attack was not as successful as the previous one in part due to the worsening weather. Also, one of the squadrons made up of, of 40 bombers, bombers each, thought they were bombing Dresden, but instead they were bombing Prague, which in Czechoslovakia, where they inflicted considerable damage. But another 300 plus bombers delivered a further 7, 771 tons of bombs over the already twice bombed city. Two years later, the Marshall Railway Yards of Dresden, one of the officially primary targets, were not significantly damaged. In fact, 
the railway system had gradually become operational within three days. Still, notwithstanding the imminent end of the war, Dresden was to suffer another large scale attack at the end of the month. By this time, however, the Germans were better organized, and they sent in their jet fighters, Messerschmitt 220, which destroyed a good number of bombers before they reached Dresden. To give an idea of the devastation of Dresden, 1,600 acres were destroyed in one night, compared to just about 600 acres throughout the whole war for the city of London. That the intent of the whole operation was to kill people is clear, for example, from a directive sent to a group of bombers for the raid carried out the next day on the city of Chemnitz. Tonight, your target is to be Chemnitz. We are going there to attack the refugees who are gathering there, especially after last night's attack in Dresden. Your reason for going there tonight is to finish off any refugees who may have escaped from Dresden. Though the count of the dead, as we will see, became impossible, the most reliable number of victims for Dresden was 135,000. In this instance, Wikipedia is wrong. And for the first time during the war, there were not enough able bodied survivors left to bury the dead, or what was left of them. On Wednesday, of February 14, 1945, the city was obscured was obscured by a three-mile-high column of yellow-brown smoke and fumes, typical of a firestorm tornado. And all along the Albay Valley started raining particles of smoldering clothing, paper bags, and all sorts of remains of personal effects. Fifteen miles from Dresden, a man found his garden littered with medical prescriptions and pill boxes that came from a pharmacy or a hospital. And as mentioned, a tornado style column of fire developed where the temperature inside has been calculated to reach up to 1,000 degrees Celsius. The firestorm reached its peak during the three hour interval between the first two attacks. A railwayman near Postplatz saw a mother with a baby carriage being sucked towards through the street into the flames of the tornado. During the interval between the first two raids, People who had taken refuge in the cellars and basements could have technically come out and run towards the suburbs, but many, actually the majority, were scared to come out. Some of the bombs were timed to explode after the raid ended, and they did. Therefore, thousands died in the basements and cellars. They were torched by the heat and or asphyxiated by the lack of oxygen or, car or by carbon monoxide. The night of the attack was the last day of the carnival. From Tuesday. People had gone to the movies, and many of the countless children killed in the attack were wearing actually carnival, were wearing carnival costumes and masks. The players and marches launched by the attacking squadron centered on the stadium, which, as you see, is or was near the Gloucester Garden, a big park comparable in size to Hyde Park in London. Many bombs fell into the park and even in the zoo. Directing the emergency Germany operations was General was General Eric Eric Hampe, and as he reached the city, the way to the station was completely blocked. But the first living thing that he saw was a large llama that escaped from the zoo. Also in town, on the occasion of the carnival, car carnival was a well-known circle called Travassani, which was hit by the bomb. Forty horses were incinerated. He brought them to the edge of the river Elbe, and for days, the vultures who had also escaped from the zoo were seen flying over the carcasses of the horses. Ironically, the attack on Dresden was officially launched, launched right, to disrupt the railway traffic. If so, as I said, three days later, the railways out of Dresden were already operational. Incendiaries do not burn rail, and it is clear that the operation was intended to kill as many civilians as possible. General Hampi noted that if the Allies really wanted to disrupt railway traffic, they could have bombed the Marienbrücke Bridge. It would have taken weeks to replace. The most gruesome aspect of the Dresden genocide was dealing with the 135,000 corpses. The Germans set up an office called Abteilung Tote, or Department of the Dead. In the end, the task proved impossible 
In just a few hours, Dresden was converted from a fairy tale city into a heap of ash and charred corpses. Apart from the architectural and artistic treasures, on Fat Tuesday, the circus was going. Many cinemas were filled with crowds enjoying their own, their own way the end of the carnival. Now everything was gone. Furthermore, the third raid by the Americans, including the Mussani fighters instructed to fire on anything that moved, especially the rift tracks heading toward the city. They even straight, straight uh, road adjacent to the Grosser Garten, called Pier Garten Strasse, where what remained of the famous Kreuzkirche choir, children's choir, tried to take refuge. The Abteilung Tode uh, did, did what it could with German accuracy to attempt to identify the victims, at least those who carried some undestroyed personal, personal documents. In that case, they assigned a serial number to the corpse, retrieved the documents, and stuck a skewer into the body carrying the same serial number they had assigned to the victim. In many cases, people were actually fused to the asphalt as they were incinerated by the incendiaries. Accessing the cellars and the bunkers where victims were di had died by the hundreds became an incredibly gruesome task. At the beginning, there were not enough gloves available as the supplies had been destroyed during the raid. Boots were also badly needed, and the rotting bodies had created a slime in the cellars, and we can imagine what it was like. Workers who had masks would continuously imbue with alcohol a sponge that they would put, they would put after the air filter in the mask. An indication of the heat generated by the bombs were the melted pots and pans discovered in some cellars in the center of the old stad, as it was called. One survivor wrote to his mother about seeing the mother and the child shriveled and charred into a piece, into one piece and stuck, stuck rigidly, rigidly to the asphalt. They had just been dug up. The child was underneath the mother, and all he could make up was his shape. An inspector of the German fire services wrote in his memoir that the genocide in Dresden fostered the suspicion that the Allies' intent was actually to destroy, to eliminate completely the German people. We talk about the Holocaust. And for, for one more time, writes this, writes this inspector, the event brought together the Germans and drove them into the arms of the Nazi propaganda. The world learned the immensity of the destruction and of the genocide from various sources, including a report written by a Swiss, by a Swiss person living near Dresden who described the scene for a Swiss newspaper, and the news quickly spread. Quoting from this article, he said, The sight was so appalling that without a second glance, I decided not to pick up my way among the corpses. For this reason, I turned back and headed for the Grosser Garten. But here it was even more appalling. Walking through the ground, I could see torn off arms and legs, mutilated corpses, and heads which had been wrenched off the bodies and rolled away. In places, the corpses were still lying so densely that I had to clear a path through them in order not to tread on arms and legs. The director of the Abteilung Tode was Mr. Voigt, Mr. Voigt. The personnel assigned to remove the corpses from the cellars and bunkers often refused to carry out their work. To give an example, he went himself to enter one cellar with the rescuers, which included also prisoners of war, refused to enter. In that case, a small high explosive bomb had penetrated four floors of the building and exploded in the basement. It is estimated that about 200, 300 people had taken shelter in there, and the cellar floor was covered by an 11, 11, 12 inch thick, deep liquid mixture of blood, flesh, and bone. And I could continue with this narrative, but I would invite you to read the book The Destruction of Dresden by David Irving. It was a bestseller when it came out in the 60s. And an interesting part of the book consists of the fact that Irving, in this, as in all his books, is extremely meticulous in important resources. He knows German perfectly, and the fact that has enabled him to gain acceptance among the Dresden survivors and among those who were the authorities at the time of the genocide. Eventually, it became impossible to attempt to identify the victims. It was decided to create an immense, an immense pile of bodies 
stuck by the hundreds in layers or separated by straw. Underneath the pyre, a fire was lit until all the dead were consumed. There is an interesting aftermath to this apocalyptic event. The end of the war was about two months away, and soon the Red Army would enter the city. In the aftermath of the genocide, the British Air Command issued a statement saying that the raids on Dresden were conducted following a Soviet request. This was clearly fake news, and in the later statement, they, they removed the reference to the Soviet. Then Churchill signed a memorandum on the subject of the continued air offensive on, on, on civilian targets. In which memorandum he hinted that it was better not to destroy population centers completely, so that after the war there may be still something to, to value to get to get back to England. And by this he essentially exempted or tried to exempt himself from responsibility, even if there is ample documentary evidence that the idea of bombing civilians was originally his. The Air Department objected strongly to this memorandum by the Prime Minister, and Churchill modified it somewhat. In it, he still suggested, again, to go a bit more easy on destructions so as to be able to get materials after the war for English needs, but without hinting that the blame for the raid rested on the initiative of the Air Force. In his memoirs, Churchill consigns the Dresden genocide to history with 22 words. We made a heavy raid in the latter month of February on Dresden, then a center of communication of Germany's Eastern Front. We could say that 135,000 people died, twice as many as Hiroshima, as Hiroshima, almost for the fun of it, as there were no military targets involved. They died in a senseless pursuit of power, and it is a lesson which we should hope may not be lost on today's political cadres, cadres, though I'm not very optimistic. Thank you for watching. This is Jimmy Molnia for Historical Sketches. See you next time. Good night. Mm -hmm.